Amen. Well, what a great morning already to just get to gather together and really raise up the name of Jesus and focus our attention on him, the King of Kings and his majesty. Man, uh, what a great song uh, leading into even the, the passage and uh, topic that we're going to be looking at this morning. Hey, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Adam. I serve as one of the pastors on staff here at Storyline. Uh, and if you're visiting for the first time, we're especially glad that you are here. I would love to get to meet you after the service uh, if we haven't met yet. Uh, but man, what a good morning already. And uh, I think part, part of it feeling like a good morning, apart from the worship, is it feels like fall now, doesn't it? Are you ready for fall? Yeah, school is starting back. College football is back on. Uh, people are talking about pumpkin spice lattes, and so it feels like fall. And uh, one, of the, one of the more exciting reasons for it to be fall around here at Storyline is our discipleship environments are kicking back off. And so we're excited about that. The Institute has already been meeting for a couple of weeks. And this week, home groups and our men's and women's Bible studies are ready to roll. And so we're pumped about that. And we're already excited about what God's going to do this fall. We don't really know what he's going to do yet, but we expect him to. And so we're really excited about what he has in store for that. But this morning, we're actually finishing up the series that we've been uh, walking through this past summer. And so rather than looking forward to the fall, I actually want to spend some time looking back with you. If we could just do a, a little stroll down memory lane together and look back at the series that we've walked through over this summer. And, and what we're talking about is rhythms of the good life. And we've been asking this question every single week, if we were to go back and walk with Jesus on those dusty roads around Galilee, what would that have been like? Like, what would it have been like to watch Jesus, like, be obedient and to teach his disciples of, of what it looks like to follow after him and, and to live the good life? And so uh, we, we've been walking through this series, and every week we've been talking about a different habit or rhythm that helps us love Jesus more and follow after God more. And the, the very first week, if you remember, was, uh, it feels like a really long time ago, it was like three months ago, was uh, looking at Bible reading. And so we started off this series talking about just the richness of God's word and how we need that in our lives. It instructs us, it's sufficient for all of life and godliness. And so we had the challenge, what if we looked at the Bible before we picked up our phones every single morning and uh, just the life that that brings. Uh, after that, we talked about this discipline called feasting which was a fun one, right? It was around 4th of July. And uh, there's this, this idea that we of all people as believers, we have something to celebrate, right? And we can live this life of joy, even with others, even feasting over great food because of what Jesus has done in our lives. And the week after that was the opposite. It was fasting, right? Uh, which we uh, might think is less fun, but it's also important because fasting reminds us of our greatest need in life, which is more of God himself filling up our lives. After that, we talked about service. We talked about how Jesus himself came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so we, we talked about how we have the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus to others as well. After that, we talked about the Sabbath and really this principle that, that sometimes we're not very good at, but this principle of rest, how we need rest in our lives. We need margin in our lives. And ultimately, we can find rest because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross on our behalf. After that, I think we looked at meditation uh, and, and really just looking at the, the value of, of soaking in Scripture, uh, of marinating in it for a while, uh, of uh, just chewing on uh, the, these beautiful uh, truths from Scripture that remind us of hope and of what God has done. So we said meditation is actually not emptying your mind of everything, it's actually filling your mind with the things of God. And that's really valuable for us. We talked about stewardship, the opportunity to, to give of ourselves and give towards the mission that God's put us here on earth for. Uh, and part of that mission is evangelism. That was the next week. We talked about just the, the, the beautiful opportunity that we have to join with God in pursuing after people and joining him and sharing the gospel as he's seeking after the people around us. And then last week, we talked about gathering, 
We talked about the, the rhythm of coming together every week and, and worshiping together and reminding each other, rehearsing the good news of the gospel. And uh, you're doing that this morning, so well done. Uh, maybe you were here last week and heard that, um, but I'm so glad that you're here. And I hope, I hope over this summer that this has been an enriching series for you. And you, you might have just seen all of these and thought, man, um, that's a lot, like 10, 12 different habits. And like, I don't have an extra three hours to my week. How could I possibly do all of that? And what we've been trying to say along the way is actually, we don't necessarily want you to start new things. Maybe, maybe you need to, but really the habits that already exist in your life uh, of rethinking them or reframing them so that we can maximize our passion for following after Jesus. And so uh, this morning we get to end this series by thinking of a, a, a really an important rhythm which is prayer. And, and so I'm excited to look with you at what it means to, as a follower of Jesus, spend time in prayer. Now, here's what I know about some of you in this room. Some of you, like your hobby is prayer. You love prayer, you love to talk about prayer. Like if you get on the conversation of prayer, every, everyone knows to not bring it up around you because you can't shut up about it, right? You love prayer. And, and maybe you have this, this vibrant prayer life where you spend time in the presence of the Lord. And that's awesome. But for others of you in this room, I know that your greatest nightmare is to be called on at home group to pray in front of everyone else in the room, right? And, and, and maybe you're in between there. Uh, maybe you would say, man, I, you know, I've, I've followed Jesus for a little while. I kind of get prayer, but I don't always really know what to talk to God about. I don't always know like, what to pray about. Uh, I, I don't always necessarily get, get prayer. Or maybe you don't feel like a good prayer. And so uh, if that's you in this room, I want you to, to uh, feel comforted here because you're actually in really good company. And so if you feel like you somewhere along the way missed the memo on how to pray, or uh, maybe you just struggle to pray, maybe it's not a habit that you've really practiced. When we get to the Gospels in the New Testament, we actually see that Jesus' disciples need to learn how to pray. And they actually come up to Jesus and they, they say, Lord, teach us to pray. And, and, and what's really interesting about that is the disciples were Jewish men. And so they grew up going to the synagogue, reciting prayers. They saw rabbis praying. They were taught how to pray. They prayed regularly, most, most likely. And so for these guys to come up to Jesus and say, hey, we want you to teach us to pray is really remarkable, right? It's because they spent time with Jesus and they began to notice something different about the way Jesus was praying, right? And if you read through the Gospels, you, you, you pick up on this pattern that, that Jesus would get away from the everyday life to spend time in prayer. And so we might even just say, you know, if it's clearly a value for Jesus, if it's that important for Jesus to get alone with the Father, then like how much more do we need prayer in our lives? But what's, what's also interesting is they began to hear Jesus addressing God, not as some distant deity, but as my father. He talked to the father. And, and there was this intimate relationship that was happening as Jesus prayed. And, and so the disciples see there's something different here. And we went in on this and they say, Jesus, teach us to pray. And so Matthew records this incredible uh, passage where Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray. And if you have your Bible, I'd love for you to look at it with me in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter six, beginning in verse five. So, so turn with me there. And as you're turning there, let me just kind of paint the picture of the scene for us. Jesus is on a hillside next to the Sea of Galilee. He's been preaching for hours. He's about to get to the subject of prayer. And there's hundreds, if not thousands of people listening to what we now call the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is showing them what it looks like or what it means to follow after Jesus and to be a part of this kingdom of God. And so look with me at Matthew chapter six, beginning in verse five. Jesus says this to his disciples and, and the crowd there. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. And truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room 
and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Now, I want to pause there and sort of dig into this a little bit with you. Uh, what's, what's fun is that our men's and women's Bible studies are going to do a deep dive into the Sermon on the Mount in a few weeks. So I don't want to steal their thunder, but I do want to briefly explain what's happening here in Matthew 6. Jesus is comparing uh, the life of a true and authentic disciple with that of what he calls a hypocrite. And, and the word hypocrite is actually an old Greek word. Uh, it actually meant like a stage actor. They were just called hypocrites instead of actors. And what it meant is that on stage, they portrayed this different persona, this different personality than their real world identities, right? And over time, they begin to take this word and, and, and use it and apply it in a different way like Jesus is here to really mean people who are projecting something that's not really true of their inward selves. It's not real life for them. And so Jesus says, don't be like that. Don't pray that way. Uh, and, and here's the first thing we really see from these verses. And the first thing I want you to see today is that prayer is more about your heart. Prayer is more about your heart than your performance. And maybe you've been in situations where you feel like you've got to like show up to pray, right? Or like you have to say the right words or, or say it in a certain way. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the movie from years ago called Meet the Parents. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend it, but there's this scene in it. There's this scene, this awkward, cringy scene uh, where they're at the dinner table. Uh, he's dating this woman. He wants to propose to her. He's with her parents, and they ask him to pray. Do you remember this scene? If you've seen the movie? And he does not pray, but he's going to fake it until he makes it, right? And so he just goes for it. And he starts saying things like, oh, thank you, sweet, sweet Lord of hosts, for this smorgasbord that you have aptly laid in front of us at this table. And, and he just kind of goes on and you just think, oh, that is awful, you know? Don't even, like you're trying too hard. Maybe you've uh, been in a home group where you feel like people are trying too hard. They try to say the, the these and the thous and spakets, right? <laughs> and what Jesus is getting here is God actually wants you, not the fancy version of you. Right? Like he actually cares more about your heart than your performance. And so Jesus says, don't be like them. Don't just try to fake it till you make it, but be real with your father. He sees you in secret and he wants, and he already knows the real you. And so he actually, he actually tells his disciples, don't go on babbling like the Gentiles do when they heap up these empty phrases thinking that they'll be heard for their many words. Now, just some, some quick historical background here. The other religions of that day, which were practiced by the Gentiles, meaning the non-Jews, often had these like incantations or, or repetitive prayers. There were these rote prayers that they had memorized and they would just pray over and over and over and over again as if to try to catch the ear of whatever God or deity they were praying to at the time trying to get what they wanted or appeal to that God. And Jesus, what I love here is he's saying something radically different, isn't he, about prayer. He's, he's saying that, that God actually hears our prayers and we aren't using prayer as some sort of mechanism to try to twist his arm into getting what we want, even though we try that at times, right? And so Jesus actually says in, in verse eight, if you look at that with me, he says, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, hang on. God already knows what we're about to pray for, what we're about to ask, and what we already need. And you might, you might read that or hear that, and if I'm one of the disciples, I'm probably sticking my hand up and be like, Jesus, what's the point of prayer then? Right? If God already knows what I'm about to say or he already knows what I'm about to ask, then what's the point? Why do we pray? And so Jesus is about to show them what prayer is truly about. And I love this. I think this is so helpful as we think about pray, prayer and like spending time in prayer with God. And so in Matthew 6, 9, Jesus begins to lay out this model of a prayer for believers. Uh, you might be familiar with this, quoted in movies all the time. And uh, we often call it the Lord's Prayer, 
but actually Jesus is giving it to his disciples to pray, so it would be better uh, labeled the disciples' prayer or the believer's prayer, but, but we call it the Lord's Prayer. Here's, here's what he says in Matthew 6, 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, I want us to just pause here and, and really see what Jesus is doing, see what he's modeling for us. And, and here's the second point that, that I want us to see this morning, is that prayer is more about who God is than who we are. Prayer is more about who God is than who we are. And, and I think if we had a conversation about it, right, like our default is to kind of start with me, myself, and I, right? And, and usually, pretty quickly in prayer, we get to the, God, I need this. God, I want this. God, help me with this because of this. We get there pretty quickly. But that's not how Jesus starts off by praying. Where does he start? He starts with our Father, I love this. He starts by recognizing who it is that we're praying to before getting to all the I needs and I wants. I I want us to just think about the significance of this for a moment. He says, our Father, our Father. I was thinking about this a moment ago as we were singing some of these songs this morning. It's just amazing that we don't serve this distant, unknowable God as if he was distracted or uninterested in our lives. Like that's not who the Bible portrays God to be. Instead, he's he's personal, right? Like we have this personal relationship that we share. He calls us sons and daughters as we we come to faith in Jesus. And, And so we can call him our father. Like we're a part of the family, right? We're family members. And, and it's just incredible to recognize that this is who we are praying to. He, he's a personal God. At the same time, he's also a transcendent God, isn't he? We're just saying these words of, of how he's holy, which means he's completely other than, he's completely unique. He's different than any other being in the entire universe. And so what if when we prayed, What if we didn't rush past this? What if we just stopped for a moment? And before we get to the I needs and the I wants and our laundry list of things, what if we stopped and just recognized who it is that we're praying to? This is our Father, our Father who's in heaven. And so not only do we have this personal relationship with him, but if we really stop to recognize who it is that we're speaking to, we're also reminded, right, that he is the God who literally spoke creation into existence. Like Colossians and Hebrews explain to us that like Jesus opened his mouth and galaxies shot out of his mouth. Like he spoke the universe into existence. And not only did he create it all, according to the Bible, he also, at every moment, is actively sustaining all things, according to Colossians 1, by the power of his word. Like every molecule in your body, he is actively, at every moment, holding it together. Isn't that a wild thought? That if God, for any nanosecond, stopped thinking about you, you would cease to exist. So yeah, God knows you and he cares for you. And that this is the God who is sovereign over the entire universe. He wields all authority. He is glorious beyond all comprehension. He's holy in all of his excellencies and perfect in all of his acts. He's inescapably just and supremely good in every sense of the word. And this divine Trinitarian God that we worship also cares about you. Isn't that incredible? Like God loves you, and he pursues after you, and he wants relationship with you, and he delights when you come to him in prayer, when you spend time with him. Isn't that amazing? Like, he wants that. He wants to spend time with you. He is not too busy for you. He desires that. He calls us into that. And so when we think about prayer, when we start praying to this all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God, isn't it worth just slowing down for a minute and recognizing this is our Father? 
We start by recognizing who it is that we're praying to. Jesus moves on. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And and this is really like a prayer, a, a desire saying like, God, would your name be treated as holy? Would your character, would your renown, would it be made and treated as holy, not, not my name, right? Not my renown, not my fame, but yours. And that really leads into this next part of the prayer. Look at verse 10 with me. Jesus prays this. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And maybe you're like me and you've heard that Uh, that passage or that verse said over and over uh, for years. But if we really stop and think about it, like there's a lot there. That's a a fairly deep prayer. And here's the third thing I want us to see this morning is that prayer is more about what God wants than what we want. Prayer is more about what God wants than what we want. And so uh, again, we're recognizing who it is that we're praying to And now a follower of Jesus moves on to this moment of surrender before God where we can honestly say, I want what you want, God. Now, I think if if we were honest, I think we could say, like, it's actually pretty easy to come to God in prayer, right, and say, God, I already have my life planned out. Like, this this is what I want. This is what's best for me, right? Like, this is my plan, and I would love for you to just make it happen for me. That's, that's how we pray oftentimes, right? We say, God, this, then this, then this, then this. They got it all figured out. And we often think that we know what's best for us. But in this moment, Jesus is showing us that the right posture of a disciple is to admit to God, God, it's not about my kingdom. It's not my wants or my desires or my plans. God, it's not about my dreams and my goals. It's about your plans for my life, your desires. And that's a hard thing to say, isn't it? Like that's that's a hard thing to honestly be able to pray, God, your kingdom come, not mine. That's not natural for us. That's like not our our default setting. Normally we wanna have control, right? We wanna figure out and plan out our lives. But Jesus is showing us it's, it's not about our plan. Maybe you have something going on in your life right now that you're praying about. And this is a really hard thing to be able to say, right? That God, I I want what you want for me. Maybe you're even, you would be honest and say, I'm actually angry at God about some things that have happened to me or happened in my life. Like, I, I I don't wanna say your kingdom come. I don't want to want what God wants right now. Maybe you would say you're holding on tight to something and you might even sense, right, that that God wants you to let it go. And it's a little painful to be able to say, your will be done. Later in the book of Matthew, we actually see Jesus practicing there what he's preaching here. And I want us to see this because I I think it it shows us that accepting God's will for our lives is not always automatic, and that's okay. And in in Matthew chapter 26, you, you don't have to turn there. We'll have it on the screen, but you can if you want. In verse 38, Jesus is with his disciples, and we catch this scene of him praying. And he's praying to his father, and I want you to see how he is struggling to be able to say, your will be done in my life. Because that's us, that's us. And so uh, verse 38, then Jesus said to his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even to death, so remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, Jesus fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Maybe you're familiar with this scene. This is happening in the Garden of Gethsemane just hours before Jesus is arrested and carried off to the cross where he will suffer and die for the sins of the world. He knows what's coming. And before he gets there, he spends time with his disciples, well, kind of with his disciples, like he'd fallen asleep. 
but he spends time praying. Right? Like, like that is what his focus is before he goes to the cross. And at, at this moment, when he knows what is quickly approaching, we are vividly reminded, aren't we, that Jesus is human. Like he's feeling these human feelings. He feels pain, he experiences heartache, and he's feeling anguish about what is about to happen to him. And so he says, Father, if there is any other way, Take away this cup of your wrath from me. But look at what he said. Nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. I love this scene because it's, it's so real. And, and we see it takes Jesus some time to get there where he can honestly say, I want what you want. And so we actually see he goes away, uh, prays, comes back. His disciples are sleeping. He wakes them up, says, hey, I need you to pray with me. He goes back and prays some more. They keep falling asleep, but that's fine. But look at verse 42. It says, again, for the second time, Jesus went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. And so leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And so Luke actually describes this moment as so intense that Jesus is like sweating drops of blood because he is wrestling with his anguish and his grief that is inside of him, of maybe even terror of what is about to happen. And so for a second, a third time, he goes away, he prays the very same thing again, and he says, God, if there's any other way, let's do that. But nevertheless, your will be done. And what we see happening in this moment, I think is so helpful, is that Jesus is wrestling in prayer with God's will. Like he is working to align his desires and his plans with the Father's will and plan. Do you see that? And what I love is that it's not automatic. It actually takes Jesus some time and some wrestling, meeting with God in prayer to get to the place where he obediently goes to the cross. Jesus shows us what it looks like to wrestle with God's plan. And he's praying for hours. He's struggling to get his desires in line with God's. And so I want you to hear this. The work of prayer, the work of prayer is getting to where I want what God wants. The work of prayer is getting to where I want what God wants. And notice that it's okay to pray for what we want. Like Jesus does that, right? But even more importantly, it's, it's getting to a place of surrender and saying through prayer something that's very difficult to honestly say and mean, your kingdom come and your will be done. I love that Jesus does obediently go to the cross and he gets there, he's able to do that through spending time in prayer and wrestling with this. And I, I just wanna briefly encourage you with this. There might be things in your life that you need to wrestle with God about in prayer. And it probably will take more than five minutes. But maybe you can do it in five. It, it might be several hours on your knees, bearing your heart to God and sharing your concerns and your worries and your fears. And God wants that. He wants the real you. He wants the angry feelings. He, he wants the authentic to you. So I wanna encourage you, wrestle with God in prayer and do the work of prayer to where you can honestly say at the end of the day, I want God what you want. Because prayer is more about what God wants than what we want. Look at the last few verses with me. These are familiar to many of us. Verse 11, it says, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, you'll notice that the first half of the prayer really is a focus on God, isn't it? It says, uh, Our Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. And, and now we have a shift to us and our needs and bringing those before God. But if you remember in verse eight, he already said, God already knows what you need. He already knows what you're about to ask, right? So what's the point of bringing our needs before him? Why do we pray? And here's what we see. 
is that God delights when we bring our needs to him because that means we are depending on him and not on ourselves. That's what's happening here. It's not informing God, it's depending on God. And that's the, that's the last thing I want us to see is that prayer is more about dependence upon God than the informing of God because he already knows. It's not a surprise to him. And so it's not about making him aware of our needs. It's about trusting him with our needs. Saying, God, I can't do this without you. Like, I, I need you to come through for me. I need you to be faithful. I need you to provide. Recognizing who we're praying to and getting to a place where I want what he wants really does put into perspective what we pray for, doesn't it? And so we bring our, our needs before him. And, and so this idea of daily prayer what was very real for the disciples hearing that being taught back then. They lived day to day in the first century world. They would work hard one day for a denarius, and that was enough money, it was a small silver coin, that would get them through the next day and provide food for the family. And so when Jesus says, your daily bread, like that resonated with them. They understood that they were very dependent upon that provision and particularly God's provision every single day of their lives. And whether we realize it or not, that is equally true of us, isn't it? That we depend on God. And so prayer is a way that we lean into that. And we say, God, I am dependent upon you. I am not an independent creature. I'm a dependent creature, and I desperately need you. And so Jesus covers several needs here. Certainly food, we need food. But he also covers forgiveness. And he covers freedom from sin. And so we, we ask for forgiveness, even as we forgive. We ask that God helps us to pursue him and flee from sin because we want him more. And so uh, I actually wish we could dig in more to some of these verses. One of the beauties of home group is that you get to do that in your home groups and, and really talk about and dialogue, like, what, what, what does this mean here for us? Like, how do we ask God for our needs here? But this is what it looks like, right, to, to bring our needs to God as a disciple. We do have needs, and we're saying, God, we need you to meet those needs. God, help us. Help us. And so we're trusting God from our hearts. Well, hey, every week during this series, we, we present kind of a challenge for us for the, for the coming week. And so this is our very last one as we think about prayer. And, and I think it's simple, but maybe profound if you've gotten away from the habit of spending time with God in prayer. And so here it is. Pray every day for five minutes. Just find five minutes in your day to get alone with your Father. And what if, what if when you start praying, you don't rush to the needs and the wants and the list of, of prayer requests that we have, but what if you just started by recognizing who it is that you're praying to? This is our Father. God, you are so wonderful. You're so wise. You're so powerful. You're so all-knowing. And thank you for loving me, right? And so what, what if we started there, and what if we did the work of prayer, of getting to a place where we honestly want what God wants? And then we bring our needs to him. And he delights in that. He wants us to bring our needs to him. So don't hear me saying don't, don't pray for things. He wants that. But we can start in a better place, which is with him and not with me. Hey, maybe you're in this room and you would say, man, I, I don't know that I've ever thought about prayer this way, like a personal relationship with a father. I don't know that, that I've ever uh, even started a relationship with God. And if that's you, man, we would love to help you take your first step of trusting in Jesus and turning from sin and following after him. We would love for you to follow Jesus with us. And so if you want a conversation, I'd love to talk with you or our prayer team that comes up front after the service, they would love to talk with you about how to begin a relationship of following after Jesus. I think the, the most appropriate way to end our time together here is to pray. And so would you pray with me? Father, um, even as we reflect on who you are, we are in awe of your greatness and your majesty and your beauty. God, even just to, to recognize that you are the sovereign Lord over the universe, the one true God, 
You are holy and magnificent and beautiful in all of your ways, and you are just and right, and you're also good to us. God, it blows us away that you, in all of your majesty, also care about us this morning, right now. God, that you actually love us and you have pursued after us and you care even about the small needs in our lives that seem insignificant. And yet you delight when we bring those things to you. And so God, I, I just pray for us, even this week, as, as we put into practice this habit of prayer, God, help us to delight our hearts and ourselves in you. Help us to spend time enjoying you. God, I pray for the those in this room who are wrestling with things. God, I pray that you would help them to take it to prayer and to want what you want so that we can honestly say your kingdom come and your will be done in our lives. God, would you help us there? Help us to be a praying people. Help us to, to lean into you and depend on you with all of our needs. Even when we think we have it together, God, help us to depend on you. God, we love you. We thank you so much for the life, peace, the hope that we have through Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray together.